classrooms across North America uh, and beyond. And since school started to close in March, we've been broadcasting three to four live events a day with scientists and explorers, conservationists from all over the world. Now, today is a really exciting uh, day. We couldn't be more excited uh, to be connecting with Parks Canada on top of a mountain in Yoho uh, National Park in British Columbia to explore the incredible fossil sites known as the Burgess Shales. So these fossils give us a peek into an aquatic world over 500 million years old, beautifully preserving the fine soft details that are, that are often lost of some of our early ancestors. We have Rick Cubian joining us today, the Active Field Unit Superintendent for the Lake Louise, Yoho and Kootenai Field Unit. And he's going to kind of get things rolling, kick things off for us on what looks like a very rainy day in the mountains. So, hey, Rick, it's so great to have you joining us. Thanks for braving the elements. Welcome, bienvenue. Thank you, everybody. Um, we're here on the slopes of Mount Stephen in the center of Yoho National Park today. And as you can see, we've got a bit of a rainy day, but we're really happy to be here. Um, my name is Rick Kubian, and I'm the superintendent of Kootenai and Yoho National Parks, which is a super privilege. Uh, I'm very, very happy to have the job that I have. Um, we're responsible in Parks Canada for overseeing uh, these national parks and protecting and presenting the uh, uh, elements of natural heritage that are here, uh, including something like the, that you're going to learn about today, the Burgess Shale. Um, the Burgess Shale uh, elements that you're going to learn about today. Um, and you're embedded in um, this UNESCO World Heritage Site that includes Jasper, Banff, Yoho, and Kootenai Parks. We're down here in the middle of Yoho Park today, and I'm also responsible for Kootenai National Park, which is super exciting this year because it's the 100th birthday for Kootenai National Park, um, which just is really neat for myself um, in that I grew up in the area and was lucky enough to spend uh, a whole bunch of time uh, and got sort of committed to national parks uh, and got, got a love of national parks and for parks and historic sites when I was a young person, uh, much like many of you. Uh, and that's turned into a career for me that's been such a, such a neat thing to have happened in my life and really formed, uh, uh, formed the, the centerpiece of my whole life. It's, it's uh, been, a, been a wonderful opportunity. Um, and, and it's so, I'm so lucky uh, to work with this fantastic group of people that I get to work with and protect and present these special places. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to pass you over here today to Kelsey, one of these uh, people that is just so knowledgeable uh, about the Burgess Shale here. And she's going to spend some time with you and give you an opportunity to learn about it. Um, and welcome, Kelsey. And this is here. All right. Hi, everyone. As Rick mentioned, my name is Kelsey. I'll be leading today's program, but I also have the help of a behind the scenes camera um, and support team, Anna and Vicky. Hello. Hi. You can hear them in the background there. Um, now, throughout the program, I'll be kind of ducking down and moving off the screen to grab props and images to show you. Don't be alarmed. Just take that time, like right now, to enjoy the view behind me. Okay, the last introduction I need to make is to the stars of today's program, Burgess Shale Fossils. So I'll show you a few and really take a look at all the different sizes and shapes and colors there. And these fossils are actually all around me on the rocks. I did stockpile a few at my feet, but as you walk around the shale here, it's kind of hard not to step on one of these fossils. And one of the things I really love is that as you start looking at these fossils, the closer you look, the more you see it, not just uh, one fossil, but multiple fossils and also fragments from individual organisms. So there's a lot to see here. And I know that this is maybe not quite as big or bold as, um, say, a dinosaur skeleton. But the neat thing about these fossils is that um, they're really surprising. Sometimes the best surprises come in these small packages. And that's one of the things that we're really going to dive into today and explore just what is it 
that's so surprising about the bird to share process. So to start answering that question, we have to take a step back in time. So what I'm going to show you here, and I'll just have to get some of the rainwater off of it. This is a model of Earth's geologic timeline. Now let me step back so you can see the entire thing. You can just about see that on the screen. So up here at the top, humans, present day 2020, and then all the way down this timeline, as we travel down, we hit the very bottom, roughly four and a half billion years ago when the Earth was formed. And you might have noticed that kind of lower down on the timeline here, there's not a lot going on. But as you get closer and closer towards present day, uh, things get pretty busy. Now your challenge right now is to figure out where on this timeline the bird to shell creatures belong. So when were those creatures actually alive? And I'm going to present you with two choices. You can pick between option one and option two, and then actually type your response in the chat. Vicky's in behind the camera. She's logged in live. She's going to tell me what sort of feedback is coming into the chat. So option number one, I'm going to place the Burgess Shale creatures um, right here, up next to the dinosaurs. So that's option number one. Take a quick mental snapshot. And then option number two, place the bridge of shield creatures. And I stuck to the Velcro there in between multicellular life and the transition from ocean to land. So that's option number two. Take a quick mental snapshot. And then I'll just step back for a moment here and see if we're getting any feedback in the chat. So you can type option one, option two, number one, number two. What do you think? How old are the Burgess Shale creatures? Anything coming in, Vicki? Option two. Option two. Oh, and I can actually see the options popping up on the screen. <laughs> awesome. Option one, option two, option two, number one. It's pretty split so far. Okay. Number two, number two. Lots of number twos so far. Okay, good feedback. Um, five more seconds to type in your choice if you haven't already yet. I'm going to jump in and add that those who are live with us, we have about... 30 or so students live on camera in the call from different spots. And we've got a mix between one and two as well. It's pretty even. Yeah, awesome. it's looking like there's a lot Thanks of twos so. in the comments. Nice, that's a good split. Um, I'll tell you what my choice is. It is option number two, which places the Burgess Shell creatures roughly half a billion years ago. And half a billion years ago, Earth was a very different looking place. So let me show you what that looks like. Um, I need you to imagine that you are stepping through the screen to join me here on this mountain top. We'll step into a time machine, turn the clock back half a billion years, and we've ended up in this nice warm tropical ocean floating around on the waves. If we dip beneath the waves, these are some of the things that we'll see. Shake off some rainwater there and take a look. So these are all Burgess Shale creatures. They are wonderful, but also pretty weird. So we've got some kind of uh, worm-like looking creature there burrowing through the sediment, some uh, strange, I don't know, almost plant-like looking creature. Uh, something swimming around near the top there. This very obvious giant, bizarre looking creature in the middle with these huge appendages. It actually has these giant stalked eyes. And then right next to it, a creature with gills. 
Now, this is an incredibly detailed picture, considering that this ecosystem is half a billion years old. How do we know so much about these ancient animals? How are all these details from the eyeballs there to the lacy gills, how are all those details so well preserved? Now you can think on that for a second, but the honest answer is that we don't 100% know. So scientists continue to collect evidence and test different hypotheses about what sorts of conditions and type of environment produce the bird shield fossils. It's complicated. This is us trying to interpret really deep into history. So we don't have time to dive into all that science, but I can give you a basic introduction to bird shield fossil preservation. It's starting to rain a little harder, so Joe, just let me know if you can't hear me very well. Okay, bird to shale fossil preservation. We're going to make ourselves a bird to shale fossil. So I've already put the bird to shale creature into the bottom of this mixing bowl. What I need to do right now is help collecting food. We're going to make some ingredients and a little bit of imagination and make ourselves a fossil. So I have three ingredient choices for you. We have fine sediment, oxygen, and rapid burial. So just like before with the timeline, take a moment right now and make a choice. Which of these ingredients will help turn our creature into a perfectly preserved fossil? What should I add to the mixing bowl? It could be one ingredient two ingredients, all three ingredients. It's your choice. Take 30 seconds right now to type something into the chat and I'll see what sort of feedback is coming in. All right, excellent. So although people are putting those responses in, Kelsey, I just wanna check in with the microphone. I don't know if maybe a little bit of water got on it, but the quality definitely went down in the last couple of seconds. Okay. If I talk really loud, does that help? That is better. <laughs> all right, so on my end, I see a lot of all three coming in from those who are live in the call with us. Okay. Vicki, any different feedback? I got a lot of threes. Okay. Not a bad choice. See two, three, another three. Lots and lots and lots okay. of things. All right. These are my choices. Rapid burial and fine sediment. The wind and rain are starting to spin up, so I will start to yell. You can still hear me. So why not oxygen? Imagine a scenario half a billion years ago, a tiny little bird shield creature is swimming around in the ocean right next to this giant underwater cliff, showing all the cracks and crevices, and not only there's this giant muscle crack in the creature, carries it down to the ocean floor, rapidly buries it in fine sediment, and the creature dies. So the body is left exposed, picked at by scavengers, so it's completely and completely buried. Now those particles of sediment are so fine that they fill all the cracks and crevices around the organism, leaving very little space and very little oxygen, which is really important. Oxygen is what we need for decomposition. Sorry, Kelsey, I'm just gonna jump in. I don't yeah. I don't know if it's just because the rain picked up or the wind picked up a little bit, but it's getting it is getting tricky to hear you. Really hard to hear. Is does the microphone is the microphone covered right now? It is. We have it under an umbrella. Yeah. I'm wondering if the umbrella is too loud with the rain hitting us. Well, I think when you're a little bit closer as well, that helps too. Okay. Uh, maybe we'll try something. I'm putting a plastic bag just 
over as part of the microphone. I'm taking the umbrella off for a second. Hold the umbrella higher. <laughs> Give us a minute here, Joe. We'll do some trouble shooting. That's okay. You definitely, it's it's the, the adventure of broadcasting in the field. Yeah. They can't predict the weather. We've moved the umbrella up a little bit. Did that help or no? You sound you sound good right now. So let's 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 try and go forward and see how we do. Okay. Go we'll move forward from there. Bring our minds back to all those ingredients that we're adding to the mixing bowl. We don't want oxygen because it actually speeds up the process of decomposition. And if we're trying to make the perfect gorgeous shale fossil, we don't want our creature to decompose. We want it to be left completely intact. So all I'm going to add to the mixing bowl is rapid burial and fine sediment. Now I'm actually going to add quite a bit of fine sediment to the bowl. And normally I would just pour this in, but it's rainy. So this is going to make a big old muddy mess in the bowl. Use your imagination. Imagine I'm pouring in a ton of fine sediment. Why? Because over the years, that fine sediment really accumulates into lots and lots of layers on top of the fossil. Now a secret ingredient. So we have rapid burial and fine sediment in the mixing bowl. I'm going to add a little bit of something, and I think it might be backwards there if you can't read it, that I call chemistry. So chemistry acknowledges that there are other hypotheses about what sorts of conditions help to preserve these shale creatures. For example, clay minerals in the sediment help slow the process of decay. So for those clay minerals, I'll add a pinch of chemistry and another hypothesis would be that a chemical reaction in that ancient ancient ocean actually helped form this hard rocky limestone layer over the fine sediment which acted like a seal and sealed off this burial too. So I'll add one more pinch for that chemical reaction and with all of our ingredients in place in the mixing bowl all we have to do is apply a lot of pressure uh, a little bit of heat, let the rocky mountains form, and after half a billion years, we'll have a nicely preserved fossil. So this is the creature that we were trying to preserve. Uh, the card is soaking up a little bit of rainwater there, but let me show you the fossil version. So this creature is called Anomalocaris. It is the largest known Burgess Shale predator. Anomalocaris has these fantastic giant appendages up front for grabbing onto prey, and then a finned tail and these undulations down the length of its body to help it swim really fast. And of course, these giant stalked eyes for searching out and locating prey. Now the fossil that I have here is actually quite small because it's a juvenile anomalous carrot. The scientists have found adult anomalous carrot fossils that are up to about a meter in length, which is incredibly large and scary for a versus scale creature. Now, of course, Anomalocaris wasn't the only thing swimming around in the sea half a billion years ago. I can't hear anything. I will try to talk louder. Anomalocaris wasn't the only thing swimming around in the sea half a billion years ago. Let me show you a few more examples of vertical shell creatures and really good fossil preservation. getting a little bit wet here, but I think you can still make out some nice details. Joe, how's the sound? Is that any better? I can still hear you okay, Alice, or sorry, uh, Kelsey, I can still hear you okay, but the wind, it's a little bit strong, but we can still hear you. It's picked up a little bit. 
This fossil here is a trilobite, so named for its trilobes or three lobes, an axial lobe in the center, and then two plural lobes on either side. This particular trilobite is called Ogygotsis, and it's the most abundant trilobite here on Mount Stevens. This image shows you what Ogygotsis looks like in 3D form. You'll notice it has this characteristic kind of bulbous part called the glabella, which is actually where the trilobite stomach is found. And Ogygotsis, like all trilobites, has this really hard shell or exoskeleton, which is what helps these fossils preserve so well. You can see really nice detail in the rock there. Now, even though the harder parts preserve nicely, there are soft parts to trilobites as well. Take a look at this. You don't have to type anything. Whoop, you don't have to type anything into the chat. But just think about what this image is showing us. It's part of a trilobite. And if nothing comes to mind, this is a trilobite eye. So obviously we can't see this level of detail when we just look at a fossil, but under an electron microscope, you can see this incredible detail and that pattern there. And that's only possible because the fossils are so well preserved. Let me show you some show you and you might really have to squint because this fossil is incredibly tiny. I'll try and tilt it so you can make it out in the light there. And if you can't quite see that, I have a zoomed in image to show you. So this creature is called Morella splendens, also known as the lace crab. And let me compare it to a 3D model. Got to shake some rainwater off here. All right, so there they are side by side, 3D model and then the fossil version. Let me point out, on the 3D model here, you can see what are actually lacy, delicate gills. And those lacy, delicate gills, despite being so fine, are preserved right here on the fossil. That's half a billion years of sediment accumulation and mountain building, and something so fine and delicate is still that well preserved. Now, if we move from the scale of an individual organism up to an entire ecosystem, I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, what you're looking at here down on the bottom, this is what our understanding of that half billion year old ecosystem would look like if only the hard parts of the organisms preserved. So it might be hard to tell through the screen, but there are some trilobites down at the bottom there, some seashell looking creatures, and a scattering of a few other things, but there's not that much going on. 
Now up at the top here, this is what we know that half billion year old ecosystem looks like because of that exquisite fossil preservation. We see not only a variety of different organisms, but we can actually understand how they're interacting. This picture here, this detailed snapshot, tells us about the evolutionary origins of animal life on our planet. And with that, I'll let it just sink into your minds. Joe will take a break right now for questions because I've thrown a lot of information out there. Maybe the rain is letting up. Joe, I'll send it over to you for some questions. All right, excellent. Well, Kelsey, thank you for that first part of the presentation. It is an absolutely amazing area that you're visiting. I mean, the view is incredible, but what's under your feet is even more exciting. Um, this amazing ecosystem, half a billion years old, preserved down to those fine little details. I really like that picture you shared of what things would look like if only the hard parts were preserved and how much more that picture we get when we see more preserved. It's really cool. Yeah. So let's take a few questions. So those who are tuning in via YouTube, now's a great chance to start sending in uh, some questions and I'll keep an eye out for those, as well as those who are live with me in the call. If you raise your hand virtually, use the blue, uh, uh, raise your hand with that little blue hand or type in some questions in the chat and we will start uh, mixing some questions in. So let's start off here. Um, we have Lori joining us and Lori's wondering um, if there's any vertebrate fossils or is it just too early? Lori, that is an excellent question. I am not going to answer it in full because in the second part of the presentation here today, you will meet one of those vertebrates. It is not too early. All right, very, very cool. Uh, let's grab another one here from YouTube. Uh, Sky would like to know about the hike up. How long did it take you to get up to this amazing area? <laughs> Great question, Sky, and thank you. Um, it's about a four kilometer hike in distance, but the terrain looks sort of like this. So it's very steep. It's a good hike to bring your hiking poles on. Uh, and it, I mean, depending on the pace you're moving at, it can take anywhere from an hour and a half to, to three hours, just depending on your speed and if you're used to moving at higher elevations. All right. So we have in our call, Adrian joining us in Guelph, Ontario. Adrian, do you want to unmute your mic and go ahead with your question? What is the weirdest fossil you've ever seen? <laughs> oh, Allison, can you unmute your phone? It, it, it got muted. I can't do it on my end. Can you hear me now? There you go, you're back. Perfect. Um, I have an image to show you. It's probably not only the weirdest fossil or creature that I've seen, but also one of the weirdest that the paleontologists came across. So this little creature here is called Hallucigenia. And let me show you the fossil version of that. When paleontologists first uncovered this fossil, they weren't really sure what they were looking at and they had it upside down for the longest time. So hallucigenia, my cards are sticking together in the rain. There we go. Hallucigenia has these spines on the top of its body that you can see, and then these limbs underneath but when paleontologists first found this fossil, it was so wild and bizarre. They had it flipped upside down and that's how they interpreted it for the longest time. And they also didn't really know what was the front and what was the back end. But just recently, and because of some of the really great technology that we have, the paleontologists were able to see the details on Hallucigenia's face. And they actually were looking at this little round grinning mouth of Hallucigenia. So I think, I think this is probably one of the weirdest Burgess Shale creatures and the name Hallucigenia, like a hallucination. It's just so crazy. You can't believe what you've seen. Um, I think this would be the one. 
Great question. All right, very cool. Uh, I want to visit. We have some educators in the call with us. Uh, Mr. Kilpatrick's joining us, five sixes in Cambridge, Ontario. If you want to unmute your mic and if you have a question that's come in from your students so far, we'd love to grab it. Okay, maybe I don't see Mr. Kilpatrick. So let's try. Um, let's see, Sam, you have your hand up. Go ahead, Sam, with a question. How long have you been up there? <laughs> <laughs> Sam, we hiked up here and we got here at 10 o'clock and then spent about an hour setting up. Um, and it has been raining since we got up here. <laughs> All right, let's grab one more from YouTube and then you can continue a little more, Kelsey. So okay. uh, this is a question I knew would come up today. Uh, this is from Arif and Arif is wondering, how do you know that those fossils are so old? Oh, that's an excellent question. I'll do my best to keep the answer short because it does get a little bit complicated. So the type of rock, the main type of rock that we have in the Canadian Rocky Mountains here is sedimentary rock. Sedimentary rock is quite difficult to exactly date. Other types of rock like igneous rock that have certain types of minerals in them. You can use these scientific techniques like radiometric dating and, and don't worry about that complicated word. Just appreciate that there are ways for scientists to examine the, the components of a rock and figure out an exact age of it. Now, because we can't do that with sedimentary rock, we often use what are called index fossils. So something like a trilobite that preserves really well um, and is very well known to paleontologists, those can be exactly dated if they're found in an igneous type of rock. And if I know how old this particular fossil is and for how long it was alive, and I find it in a layer of sedimentary rock, I can start drawing some connections there. So sedimentary rock gets laid down in layers and usually those layers are oldest at the bottom, youngest at the top, and then things get tricky in the mountains when thrust faults happen and sometimes older layers get put on top of younger layers. So it is a bit of a puzzle for scientists to put this whole picture together. How old are the layers of rock? and thus how old are the fossils that we find in them. So it's a combination of techniques to date fossils in sedimentary rock. It's using index fossils. It's relating the sedimentary rock layers and where we find them to other types of rock like igneous that we can exactly date. It's an excellent question. It's a really hard one to answer in a short amount of time and without excellent visuals because geology is so complicated um, it's a great one for YouTube though. Type, type a few things into YouTube. How do we date fossils? How do we date sedimentary rock? And I think you might find some really good visuals to step you through that complicated process. All right, very good. Well, Kelsey, we'll let you take over for a little bit. And then I know there's definitely more questions waiting uh, from our groups. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. And the rain has let up a little bit. So I'm hoping the sound quality will be better. Sounds great right now. Awesome. Okay, to start off the second and shorter part of our program here, I'm going to read you a few news headlines. So from the Canadian Geographic, August 2017, ancient spine-headed marine worm fossil identified in Burgess Shale. From CBC News, July 2019, Millennium falcon fossil shows what it took to thrive 500 million years ago. And then finally, from the Rocky Mountain Outlook, September 2019, Burgess Shale site in Marble Canyon yields yet another new species. So I hope you caught the dates there, 2017, 2019. What these news stories are telling us is that Burgess Shale fossil discoveries aren't just the a thing of the past. They're very much current and happening right now. So if you travel roughly um, 35 kilometers in that direction, you'll run into Kootenai National Park, where some incredible new fossil sites are currently being explored with some pretty amazing results. 
So I'll show you one of those sites, fresh off some of the rainwater here, one of those sites near Marble Canyon, where paleontologists started excavating fossils in 2012. And they were just absolutely astounded by the sorts of things they were finding. One of the paleontologists said something that really captured um, like the relevance, the significance of the fossils they were finding. That paleontologist's name is Jean-Bernard Caron, and he is one of the world's leading experts on Burgess Shale fossils. So he said, there's a bigger story here than dinosaurs. This is the story of where we came from. So I can actually introduce you to one of our ancient ancestors, and this will help answer that earlier question about vertebrates. Okay, now this particular fossil can be a little difficult to see, but I think I've kept it dry enough. I'm gonna hold that up as close as we can get. And I know it sometimes just looks like a gray smudge on the rock, but I hope that you can see a little bit of a pattern there uh, and some of the muscle banding on this creature. So this creature is called Metaspergina. It's kind of roughly a thumb-sized jawless fish. And the Metaspergina fossils found at the Marble Canyon site were so well preserved and there were so many of them that paleontologists could finally put together this clear picture of what Metaspergina looked like and why it was so significant. All right, so for the purpose of sharing via screen, I have a zoomed in image of Metaspergina which shows you a lot more detail up front there. You have the eyes and then there's actually a line that runs down the length of Metaspergina's body. And then also these kind of, I don't know, bars. They almost look like ribs. So I'll show you that in a slightly different way. Here's Metaspergina again. You can see that line running down the center so that line is a flexible rod of cartilage called a notochord. The notochord evolves into the spine, a feature that modern vertebrates like you and me actually have. And those sort of weird ribby like looking structures on the fossil there, those are called branchial bars. There were seven paired branchial bars up near the front of Metaspergina there and this Final seventh pair closest to the front is a structure that evolves into the jawbone. So all the fish that you see swimming around in the ocean today that have the jawbone, they can trace that back to Metaspergina. And those clear connections that we can draw between half billion year old life and modern day animals, modern day humans, those connections are only possible we have such great detail and soft tissue preservation in these fossils. Now, in addition to the new finds and the exciting things that are coming out of the Marble Canyon site, there's another new fossil site in Kootenai National Park, and this one's actually in the Tokum Creek Valley. Perhaps the most exciting find from that new site is this creature here, Cambro Raster falcatus. And we're going to play a quick little game here. Guess how big Cambro Raster is. I have four points of reference for you. So is Cambro Raster, is Cambro Raster as small as this wooden bead, wooden marble, we'll say, maybe ping pong ball sized, as large as the orange from my lunch, or perhaps even as big as a balloon. So take 20 seconds right now, type your answer into the chat. How big do you think this creature is? 
as small as a little wooden bead, as large as a balloon, or somewhere in between. Vicki, how's it looking? There's a delay. I've got an orange ping pong ball. Someone said the balloon. We got a little bit of everything okay. so far. Someone says a bead. Got two for orange. I've got a lot of orange with our live groups. A lot of orange. A lot of orange, a lot of balloons, a couple of ping pong balls. Okay, that's a pretty good spread. Um, I would say the size of Kimber Raster is somewhere between an orange and a balloon recognizing that fossils are of individual organisms and there's always variety between individuals um, within a species. But I do have an example of a Camberaster fossil to show you and this is super exciting for me because I've never seen one of these fossils before. They are that new and current. This is the first time I'm holding one and the rain did kind of, see if I make the whole thing wet. <laughs> The rain sometimes makes these fossils difficult to see, but I'm hoping you can make out a little bit of a spaceship looking pattern. Maybe if there are any Star Wars fans out there, this looks a little bit like the Millennium Falcon spaceship, perhaps. Maybe that's a bit of a stretch. Now, paleontologists at this new site found fossil fragments from over 150 individual Cambro rasters. And because they had so many of those fragments, they were able to piece together exactly what the form and function of this animal was. So there's a 3D image of Cambro raster with this big helmet like shield on top. And then kind of bizarre, like backwards and upwards facing eyes presumably to look out for predators like Anomalocaris swimming above. Uh, and then my favorite feature, these weird rake-like claws that Cambro Raster used to sift through the sediment on the ocean floor um, and then shove all the good stuff into its circular mouth right there. So my favorite comparison is with a vacuum cleaner. Um, Kimber Raster is basically an ancient Roomba in carpet mode that's vacuuming along the ocean floor. So I'll leave you with that fantastic image in your mind and pull us out of Kootenai National Park back here to Mount Stephen, where we can look across the valley here and with a bit of a camera tilt over to one side, you'd almost be able to see the spot where back in 2011, a really important fossil discovery was made. So someone by the name of Emily was on a guided hike and amongst hundreds of similar looking rocks, she found an incredibly rare fossil. Now at first, no one really knew what this fossil was. So the unidentified fossil was taken down to an office in the town of Field below me here, waiting to be seen by an expert. Jean-Bernard Caron, who I mentioned earlier, he was that expert. And I wish I could have been there for that moment when he sees this fossil for the first time. Jean-Bernard Caron is currently working on and about to publish a scientific paper on this creature based on the one other specimen in the entire world that exists. And all of a sudden he has two. So Jean-Bernard Caron retracts his paper, he goes back, he studies the second new specimen and is able to publish a paper that's a lot stronger because he has these two pieces of fossil evidence. Now this creature is called Ovadio vermis, and it is my favorite Burgess shale animal. I think it's absolutely adorable. It's got this great little face right there. He's stubby, short back legs with claws at the bottom for like latching on to the sediment on the ocean floor and hanging on. And then these long spiny front limbs. 
Now, Ovanio vermis, kind of like a sponge, was a filter feeder. So it filtered out all the good stuff from the ocean water. And it did that in a motion that you've probably actually seen before. So if you've ever been to a sporting event, you've sat through a stadium, the fans get bored and a wave starts going around. That wave is exactly what Ovadio vermis looks like when it's filter feeding. It draws its front limbs together and then raises them up in this giant filter feeding wave. It's absolutely fantastic to see. And if you want to check out more animations of these birdie shell creatures in action, so you can kind of appreciate what life was like back then, you can go to the Royal Ontario Museum's website. Don't panic, Joe has some of these links to share at the end of the program, but I'd really recommend their virtual fossil gallery. It has some incredible images and animations to check out that bring these creatures to life. So Joe, with that, I'll send it back to you for a second round of questions. All right, excellent. Well, again, it's, uh, you know, it's a wealth of just amazing fossils that you have and a real cool picture into some of our early ancestors. So thank you so much for sharing uh, some of that with us today. Um, okay, so again, we can raise our hand virtually if you're in the call, you can type your question directly into the chat side box. But I do have a couple educators in the call representing their students. So I'm going to go back and we will grab uh, Mr. Kilpatrick, if you want to turn your mic on, uh, grade five sixes in Cambridge. Hey, Joe, thanks so much. And uh, thanks to the scientists in the field for uh, battling through that rain today. <laughs> Um, Isra wanted to know, how do you, how do the scientists know or determine which fossil is which? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I don't know if I have the best answer for that, not being a paleontologist. I mean, it, it starts by, you kind of start at the broad level of, um, all of the life on our planet is organized, you know, these big groups, animals, plants, fungi, and then you go further, further down into specific species. So that's one place where the paleontologists start. You can have these broad categories of grouping things based on their similarities. And then you kind of get down into the details like the trilobites. And I might have... Hmm. I thought I might have an example here, but no. So there are different types of trilobites and to an inexperienced eye, they might look exactly the same, but because the paleontologists are studying these things, not only in the field and putting in an incredible number of hours, they're also at the lab benches, looking through microscopes and using all these different tools to distinguish the fossils based on these tiny details. So one trilobite called Elrathena is this really small trilobite and it kind of has a tapered back end. So the paleontologists know when they see a trilobite of a certain size, if it has that kind of characteristic shape, that's kind of the first place to go to. Oh, I think it might be this creature. And El Rathina, all of those names are things that are given to the fossils when paleontologists discover them. It's fun names like Cambro raster falcatus, falcatus after the millennium falcon, right? So there's, there's that designation there. But I really think it's just a matter of that experience, the number of hours you put in. And I can speak to that personally, because when I started looking at these fossils, a lot of them looked the same to me. And it's only after you've spent all those hours examining them that you can really pick out the fine differences and details between them. I think the paleontologists as well, because they're using such high powered microscopes and tools, they can see those details at an entirely different level as well. All right, great question. Mrs. Dahl is joining us. She's representing her students who are on YouTube from Newcastle, Ontario. It looks like some third graders hanging out with us. Uh, Ms. Dahl, if you want to turn your mic on and go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. I have a question from a student in third grade from Jenna. What's the oldest fossil that has been found at the Burgess Shale and what is it? I'm not sure, Jenna. Thanks for your question. That's one thing I'll, I'll say about that is that the Burgess Shale sites 
aren't just in the Canadian Rockies. Um, there's a map right here that shows you, can you see the yellow points on the map there, yellow dots? Yep, they're showing up. Okay, so those dots show you a number of different sites around the world where Burgess shale type creatures have been found. Because remember half a billion years ago, I mean, we're talking about what the entire planet looks like, not just what it looked like right here. So we find evidence of these similar ecosystems all around the world. And some of the places where we find that evidence, those fossils are a lot older. So they're dated back. Um, typically in the Rockies here, our fossils are dated to around 505 million years old. But at some of the sites, for example, some of the sites in China, those fossils are actually older. They're found in older layers of sedimentary rocks. So we really get this understanding that, um, and I know as humans, it's so difficult to think in these big terms and these long time frames because we just live for maybe a century. Um, but these Burgess Shale creatures, I mean, the period during which they were alive um, was about 50 million years. So there's a huge spread and just kind of by the luck of where we happen to find these deposits, we might find the fossils at different and older layers. So there's a spread. The Burgess Shale fossils in our Canadian Rockies are typically about 505 million years old. All right. Uh, Mac and Kai, go ahead with your microphone. Um. So I just want to know what, um, so is it possible to tell the fossil's gender or not? Oh, as far, that's a great question. Nice thinking. As far as I know, it's not, but we do have some clues that reproduction was going on half a billion years ago. For example, there's this one fossil called Guaptia and under its shell, paleontologists have actually found eggs. So maybe a female, um, we, we don't really know. Um, there are, as far as I'm, I'm aware, there are no assigned genders to any of the fossils. That remains a mystery that we might have an answer to maybe in a few years as more discoveries are made, but right now they're just it's. <laughs> All right, Chloe, go ahead with your microphone. What is your most uh, favorite fossil? <laughs> My most favorite fossil is the Ovadio vermis. Um, but the sad thing about that, an Ovadio vermis is like that small, like two to three centimeters, it's tiny which tells you how observant that Emily person was when she found it. Um, so Ovadio vermis is my favorite. Oh, yeah, Hallucigenia is kind of cute as well. <laughs> Everyone, and Vicky, what's your favorite? I like the Anomalocaris, the great big predator. Okay, Vicky's all about the predators. Anna? I go for that one, but I, I change my mind often depending on which one I'm looking at. Yeah. And I really like the most recent one, Cambro Raster. Cambro Raster, yeah. And it's also, I, I find it as I read more and more about these creatures or these fossils that that changes. I fall in love with a different one, one week and then another the next. Thanks for that question. All right. And Victoria, go ahead with your microphone. How many fossils have you found? How many fossils have I found or have paleontologists found? Have you? Have I found? <laughs> um, I guess that depends on what you mean by found. So every time um, I come on a hike with guests, we come out to these quarry sites and we search around for fossils and we're finding fossils, but they're fossils that are already known to science. They're not new and exciting species like Cambro raster, uh, but it is my hope that I will be the person who finds the third Ovadio vermis in the world. So every time I go out on a hike in the Rockies and I know I'm hiking into the type of um, sedimentary rock where the fossils are found, I always keep my eyes on the lookout for something new and exciting. 
All right, very cool. Well, I wish we could keep going, but our time is quickly uh, wrapping up for us. We are gonna continue in about five to six minutes with a French event afterwards. So that should be really cool. And it looks like the wind is cooperating. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. But to Rick, to Kelsey, to the whole team, I shared the links in the chat. So students can check it out. I can share it as well with the educators who joined us live in the video uh, chat as well. But thank you so much for braving the elephants or the elephants, the elements. I hope there's no elephants up there <laughs> for braving the elements. Uh, and just having an awesome presentation for us, taking us to a world that I think a lot of the students who joined today didn't even know uh, existed and that so much of it's preserved here in Canada. Yeah, and thanks, Joe. And thank you to everyone who's tuned in. Hang out for one more minute. I'm just going to turn it back over to Rick and he has a few final words to say. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciated it. The rain has stopped just in time for the program to end. <laughs> Hey, Joel, everybody. Um, I'll just wrap it up here. First off, I want to give a big thank you to the sta our staff out here today. It was pretty rainy, and Kelsey did a heck of a job uh, hanging in there with the weather because it was a tough day to do this. And I haven't heard her use a loud voice before. She kind of scares me <laughs> when she does that. Um, and uh, I just hope you're as excited as I am and how cool this is. Just the whole scene here. We, we are standing uh, in this great big bed of fossils. It's so neat to be here. And I'm just fascinated by the idea that we're able to talk to you in all the places that you are. So just really neat to, and appreciate the opportunity to do that. And I really want to encourage you all to get out to uh, parks places, to our national historic sites, get yourself involved in these things. Uh, and we do, we are celebrating Kootenai's 100th this year. So if you get an opportunity to get out here into Kootenai National Park, there's lots that you can do. And there's lots of ways to celebrate online. So I really encourage you to do that if you get an opportunity to. And Joe will have the links attached to this after the show. So thanks very much. I really appreciate it today. And, and we're back to you, Joe. All right. Excellent. Well, again, Rick, um, Kelsey, the whole team behind the scenes, thank you for an incredible event today. Uh, and yeah, we definitely look forward to more adventures uh, from Parks in BC going forward. All right. Thanks, everyone. We're going to sign off for today.